Greetings, fomites. This is Rob Bryant with my Picha Kucha entry. Pediatric preoxygenation and DSI. Because kids are not little adults, they're worse. This topic is important because kids are harder to intubate and pediatric intubations occur less frequently. This video review of 114 intubations at Cincinnati Children's Hospital shows overall 52% first pass success. Attendings and anesthesiologists, 90%. Pediatric residents, 35%. The news gets worse from here on in. The median time to tube placement in this study was three minutes. 25% of kids had a first laryngoscopy attempt that exceeded one minute. It took seven and a half minutes or more to get the tube in in 25% of kids. And in 25% of kids, three or more attempts were needed to get tube placement. The really bad news is the degree of hypoxemia that occurred. One third sets less than 90%. One in five sets less than 80%. And almost 10% of kids desaturated below 60%. 4% of these kids became bradycardic. Two needed CPR during their intubation attempt. The oxyhemocoaster is my take on the oxyhemoglobin dissociation curve. Our goal is to keep these roller coaster cars up in the green zone, in the safe oxygenation zone, and within the safe apnea zone, staying well out of the orange and well, well, well out of the red zone. To achieve this, apneic oxygenation, patient positioning, non-invasive positive pressure ventilation, and pediatric DSI for those not tolerating our pre-oxygenation attempts. Apneic oxygenation works because we absorb 10 times more oxygen from our alveoli than we return CO2 during apnea. Any air that is in the nasopharynx will passively diffuse into the alveoli because of the net negative atmospheric pressure that is created by this difference in oxygen absorption and CO2 return. When we look at pediatric brain death studies using apneic oxygenation, 16 apnea tests on 9 patients. They all went 15 minutes. None of these kids dropped their PO2 below 100 tor, and some of them had an improvement in their PO2 during the study period. Any degree of apnea will cause an increase in the CO2 and a compensatory decrease in the pH. A Additional brain death study shows a PCO2 raise of about 25 millimeters of mercury in the first five minutes with a pH drop of 0.2 in five minutes. So any child that is knowingly profoundly acidotic, we need to be careful with pushing that apnea period. The other benefit to apneic oxygenation is that the combination of high flow nasal cannula and a well sealed bag valve mask is going to generate about five centimeters of PEEP. So in the event of an unsuccessful first attempt, if we're having to re-oxygenate or pre-oxygenate these kids with bag valve mask ventilations, we're achieving PEEP and are able to oxygenate these kids better. Patient positioning also helps. Adult studies show that with head of bed elevated to 20 degrees or patients in reverse Trendelenburg, we can get an extra 90 seconds of safe apnea duration out of elective anesthesia patients. We're obviously not going to get this benefit out of a sick asthmatic kid or any other hypoxemic child. Pre-oxygenation our default setting is normally 15 liters per minute. If we crank the dial a couple of turns to the left, we can get 30 to 60 liters a minute out of the non-rebreather, giving 80 to 90% FiO2. This should result in the flow meter being the loudest thing in the room and can mean the difference between saturations of 91% and saturations in excess of 95% at the start of your intubation attempt. Non-invasive positive pressure ventilation is used less frequently in pediatric populations. Not every center is going to have a vision machine or well-fitting BiPAP masks, but we can use the standard bag valve mask from the Amber bag and ventilate using CPAP ventilator settings. Same settings as in, as in adults, 5 to 15 centimeters of water will keep you well below the lower esophageal sphincter threshold of 20 centimeters. High-flow nasal cannula are used in children with specialized nasal, ca nasal cannula. We can tolerate flow rates of up to 20 to 30 liters per minute, generating PEEP of 4 centimeters, and this study shows that kids can be successfully managed with nasal CPAP or high-flow nasal cannula alone without intubation. In the event that these kids are not tolerating your pre-oxygenation attempts, 
This is where delayed sequence intubation comes in for kids that cannot or will not be pre-oxygenated. It's a procedural sedation where the procedure is pre-oxygenation. This is established practice within the FOMAID community and is starting to catch on outside of the FOMAID community. You basically take kids with good brains and bad lungs, the asthmatics, the bronchiolytics, the bad pneumonias, or traumatic brain injury kids with bad brains and good lungs that turn up looking like the Chucky doll and acting like the Chucky doll. If we follow the academic life in emergency medicine, pulses and verbus card on DSI, we can use the same adult algorithm. Agitated patient requiring intubation, give them the ketamine, allow them to chill out, pre-oxygenate them appropriately, and proceed with your intubation in a calm and controlled manner. There are still some ketamine naysayers. The ketamine myth regarding elevation in ICP has effectively been busted. This is the best study proving this. 82 events, 82 doses of ketamine in 30 pediatric patients with known elevated ICP showed a 30% decrease at 2 minutes. Ketamine is safe in all pediatric patient populations other than those with aqueductal stenosis or obstructing CSF outflow lesions. So to summarize, kids are not little adults, they're worse. We need to ensure excellent pre-oxygenation with apneic oxygenation, patient positioning, and consideration of non-invasive ventilation during every intubation attempt. If kids aren't tolerating the pre-oxygenation, add some ketamine to the mix, and it becomes a pretty damn sexy intubation.